Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, thanks to Nuno and you know all the organizers at ICTS for making this, uh, you know, for making participation by Zoom possible. You know, we had some discussion about that. I'm very grateful. Um, yeah, so this is about um, starting with rather old work on statistical mechanics of horses. I'm talking about, you know, the horses you've all been seeing for the last week and a bit, uh, Bogomolny vortices in the abelian model. And um, are we doing what's, what Nuno described as second order dynamics, which means that there is a configuration space, which will be the moduli space of static vortices. And I'm interested in motion through that moduli space, which means that there needs to be some kind of um, phase space on top of the moduli space. And I was the cotangent bundle uh, to the moduli space. And uh, you know, then there's momenta. So physically, the tangent direction, cotangent directions are momenta, and I will have a Hamiltonian that's quadratic in momenta. So it's a typical second order dynamics. So uh, the outline is I'll, I'll remind you of this moduli space of abelian Higgs vortices. So you've seen a lot of that. And then I'll move on to sort of more specialized things the classical partition function, which was work I did a long time ago to find the equation of state of classical vortices. This is classical statistical mechanics, making use of a phase space. And then more recently, I've been interested in, can we do the quantum mechanics on this phase space? Can we quantize the second order quantization of the moduli? Uh, to, and of course, there's basically a single particle moving through moduli space, a single sort of trajectory classically, but that represents the motion of many vortices. I will have a large number of vortices, uh, n, n vortices, and a single trajectory in moduli space represents the actual physical motion of n vortices. And then I will quant quantize these n vortices. And first of all, I do it. This was work I did by myself some several months ago uh, at high temperature, because it turns out there's a simplification at high temperature, and both the classical uh, statistical mechanics and the quantization at high temperature can be expressed in terms of just basic geometrical properties of the moduli space. And uh, then I will tackle a slightly more challenging problem, the, the true statistical mechanics, so sort of arbitrary temperature, uh, quantum mechanical statistical mechanics, arbitrary temperature, where one really needs to know the spectrum of the quantum Hamiltonian. But for a general surface, so this is the underlying surface where the vortices live, for a general surface, I don't know what that um, spectrum of the Hamiltonian is. And so we have to go to some limit. And this is the limit of dissolving vortices. They haven't fully dissolved. But as Martin Spate showed last week, the geometry, or he was going to, anyway, I will repeat the statement. The geometry simplifies for dissolving vortices, and we can work out the spectrum of the uh, quantum Hamiltonian, which is the Laplacian on the, the Laplace Beltrami operator on the moduli space. We know the spectrum explicitly, and then we can do the statistical mechanics using the standard sort of partition function formula. All right. So I will start with um, this uh, abelian Higgs model, so you're all familiar with this, it's on a general closed oriented Riemann, Riemann surface, but with a Riemannian metric. So the surface is sigma, it's of genus G in general, and with second order dynamics. And uh, so it's convenient to have some coordinates here. So there's a local complex coordinate on sigma. Uh, this is the base space where the vortices are living, not the moduli space, the, the base space for where the vortices are living is sigma. And uh, I introduce a complex coordinate and I can express the metric on it, which is important in, con in this conformal uh, form that, uh, you know, there's a conformal factor, which is arbitrary provided it's positive and smooth, uh, dz dz bar locally. And um, so this is a curved background where the vortices are gonna be. And the curvature is going to affect the vortex solutions. And I certainly won't know them explicitly for general omega. Uh, but I'm assuming there's no gravity here. So the vortices have no back reaction on the geometry. We fix this background metric, and it doesn't change just because they're vortices. Um, 
And then you know, the fields are, oops, sorry, are naively um, a scalar field, phi, and also a Maxwell vector potential because it's a U1 gauge theory. So more of, um, mathematically, it's a section and a connection on the U1 bundle over sigma. And it's got a churn number, the bundle, a uh, churn number N, and N is going to be, I'm going to choose N to be positive so we have vortices rather than anti-vortices. And in fact, N is going to be large to do statistical mechanics. And um, there are these local expressions for the components of the vector potential and its field strength, F12. So in two, two dimensions, uh, I don't need to introduce time very explicitly, but it's very important that these are dynamical vortices. Uh, and the underlying theory is the, is the Lagrangian field theory of the abelian Higgs model with kinetic terms and potential terms. So it's not a chern simons theory. This has got quadratic kinetic terms. Anyway, this is the static um, information. There's a field strength basically related to the magnetic field. That's the curl of the vector potential. And because of the churn number being positive, there's a magnetic flux, uh, two pi n. And that's the integral of F12 over the surface. Um, now, you know about this uh, Bogomolny equation. So physically, you need to fix a parameter in the Lagrangian field theory. There's this cr critical coupling, which in the context of superconductivity distinguishes type 1 and type 2 superconductivity. And the critical coupling is the boundary between them. That's where you get minimal energy field satisfying Bogomolny equation. So it's in the context of super, superconductivity, uh, this particular coupling value is not very easy to realize. There are type one superconductors, there are type two superconductors. There, is, there are some superconductors very close to this critical coupling, but it's a bit difficult to uh, get the right material for that. And in any case, true superconducting vortices don't have the dynamics, I'm assuming. They, they, vortices don't move freely in superconductors. They're, there's a lot of friction. Anyway, so I'm going to do the mathematics. We're going to have uh, critical coupling assumed. And then the minimal energy field satisfy this Bogomolny equation. So now the first one I've written in is a real coordinates, but you're perhaps more familiar with it with dz bar of phi is zero. So phi is holomorphic in, on this, in this background sort of gauge potential. And then there's also the magnetic field. Uh, physically, the magnetic field is F12 divided by this conformal factor omega. That's the Hodge dual of F12. So th this is a component of a two form. If you divide by omega, you get the a scalar, which you should think of as the magnetic flux per unit area. That's the physical thing. That's, that's the magnetic field. And that's a scalar. And uh, it's, it's equal to this. And you know, you'll perhaps be familiar with this expression in terms of a moment map. But in the more naive, it just arises from the underlying Lagrangian when you do the Bogomolny rearrangement and look for the minimum of the energy. So this is the pair of Bogomolny equations. And it's well known through work of uh, Bradlow and, and Oscar Garcia Prado also followed this up in detail that uh, you don't, there are no vortex solutions to this pair of equations unless the area of the surface sigma is big enough. And you can see that by integrating this. If you integrate this over the surface, you get the churn number on the left, and you would get this one integrated on the right. That gives the area. But here there's a minus sign, and that's not negative. So uh, the uh, churn number has to be less than the area. Well, up to factors of 2 pi. And so what you, in fact, find is that the area, which is defined to be the integral of omega over the surface, has to be bigger than 4 pi times the churn number for vortices to exist. So I will be interested in large n, and uh, therefore the area has to be large. And in fact, I will assume that the area is a multiple of 4 pi n uh, rather than 4 pi n plus something. I'll be thinking of n divided by a, uh, that's the density, a, that's the number density. And I will have to assume that the number density is less than one over four pi. And I'll assume it's less by some finite amount, even as n gets very large. 
Now, uh, once you have, if this is satisfied, there are vortices and their existence has been established. And that's again, work of Bradlow, Garcia Prada, um, generalizing work that Taubes did, vortices in the plane. And um, there, so there are non-trivial static n vortex solutions and the vortex centers can be at n arbitrary locations. And by definition, a vortex center is where phi equals zero. And these are isolated points. And uh, wherever phi is zero from this equation, you see that the magnetic field is maximal. And that's typical of a vortex. It's where magnetic flux is concentrated. And the maximum is at the zero of phi. Uh, so I, both phi equals zero and the magnetic field is maximal. And then there's a unique solution up to gauge transformations with vortex centers at n specified locations, arbitrarily specified locations on the surface. Here they are, Z1 up to Zn. Now these can coincide, then you get a multiple vortex at that location, that's okay. So these are not necessarily distinct, but important is that they're indistinguishable physically. Vortices is all the same, which means that the Moduli space is going to be the set of n points quotiented by the permutation group on those n labels. And so here we are. The moduli space of solutions is the symmetrized nth power. Uh, so the nth power of sigma, but divided by the permutation group, Sn. And, uh, and you might think that, well, I mean, it's obvious that if sigma is smooth, then sigma to the n is smooth. And you might think that if you divide by the permutation group, you'd get some kind of orbifold, which wasn't smooth. But a remarkable feature about points on a two-dimensional surface is that this quotient is still smooth. And uh, to see, I mean, there's a very old result about ring and surfaces and their powers. And the way to see it is to not use as coordinates those underlying Z1 up to Zn, but to use instead the symmetric polynomials in those coordinates. So the sum, the sum of the products, and the last one is the product of all those Zn locations. And those are the symmetric polynomials. They're a basis of the symmetric polynomials, and they are the good coordinates on this, on this uh, moduli space. And it's, it, I say, smooth. Now, the important thing for the physics is that it's got a natural metric. Now, this arises from the field theory kinetic energy. I haven't written down the Lagrangian field theory, but there is a kinetic energy, which I think you've heard about in other contexts, that you know that there is a metric on this moduli space. Uh, you um, basically use the underlying field theory kinetic energy, which is just these sort of L2 norm on the time derivatives of the field. So you have a time-dependent gauge potential and a time-dependent uh, scalar field phi. Then the natural quadratic for quadratic expression in those, the L2 norms or integrated over the surface is kinetic energy. And you then restrict that kinetic energy to motion in the moduli space. You assume the vortices instantaneously are always a point in the moduli space, but you assume that point in the moduli space is moving and there's natural kinetic energy. And you think that physically is vortices moving adiabatically on the surface. And it means sort of they're moving tangent to the moduli space. So this is what we expect to happen at low energy because there isn't enough energy to excite the degrees of freedom orthogonal to the moduli space in the full field configuration space. Now, remarkably, things are known about this metric and you heard about this last week. Uh, Trevor Samuels, who was my student a very long time ago, and Ian Strawn, who studied a particular case, showed that the metric has a localized form depending only on data close to each vortex location. So in principle, the metric is some integral over the surface, but you've got these vortices and they, you can expand their field and close to each vortex location, there's a linear term. I think this was shown by um, Martin Spate in his lectures. So we know something about this metric, although not very explicitly. And then slow vo motion vortex dynamics corresponds to free motion on the moduli space, but free motion on the moduli space, geodesic motion on the moduli space, doesn't mean the vortices are not interacting. They have non-trivial interactions because the moduli space is curved and it's particularly curved where the vortices are close together. So the vortices scatter off each other, even in this geodesic dynamics. So, okay, so let me go on to particular statistical mechanics. 
this is the classical partition function. So we do a classical statistical mechanics. Uh, it's convenient to introduce real coordinates rather than the complex coordinates I had before. So you can think of these as the real and imaginary parts of those vortex locations, Z sub R. And uh, there's this metric worked out by Samuels, GIJ. And then the Hamiltonian for free motion is um, just um, quadratic in the momenta on the phase space. So it's the inverse metric times the momentum squared. Uh, and P is, is, is related to the velocity of the coordinates by, through the metric. And it's the momentum conjugate to the coordinates. And then the classical partition function, I mean, it is a standard formula from thermodynamics. Uh, there's, a, there's an overall sort of scale related to Planck's constant, even though this is classical, because you have to normalize this integral. Uh, and then you just take the exponential of minus this quadratic Hamiltonian, and you integrate over phase space. Um, this is sort a of Gibbs integral uh, and um, Boltzmann integral. And uh, <clears throat> the point here is that because it is a quadratic form, you can do the momentum integrals, and that's just Gaussian. So, you know, it's an n dimensional Gaussian integral, oh, sorry, two n dimensional Gaussian integral. So you get some factors of pi. And um, oh, yes, yeah. so the important thing is you take the energy expression, the Hamiltonian, divide by the temperature. So that's statistical mechanics. So the T is very important. And then you get this uh, partition function, there's a prefactor, which has lots of powers of n. And then um, you get a determinant of the metric, and you still got your dq integral to do. Uh, I mean, the determinant comes from the Gaussian integral. And of course, this square root of the determinant dq is the volume of the moduli space. So we get that the partition function is some sort of prefactor depending on the temperature, just times the geometrical quantity, the volume of the moduli space. And that was really nice to see that because we know things about the volume, it turns out. So on, for n vortices on a surface of genus, G, genus zero, so topologically, top, topologically two sphere, with area bigger than four pi n, which we need for vortices to exist. The volume of the moduli space is this formula here. It's basically a minus four pi n to the nth power divided by n factorial. So the n factorial comes from the identification of vortex locations that they're indistinguishable particles. And uh, naively you get a to the nth if the vortices were not interacting. But the remarkable thing is from Samuel's metric expression, one can work out the volume precisely. I mean, this uses the Kähler geometry of the moduli space, and it's basically a cohomological calculation. Uh, and you get this rather beautiful formula. And this was discussed, I think, by Martin Spade, and possibly derived. Um, well, you just substitute this into the partition function, and you get this expression here. And now I did this for genus zero, but we've now worked out what happens. I mean, long ago with my student, Sasad Nazir, we, looked, we worked out the cohomology calculation if the genus is positive. And um, it's a bit different. They're factors of A to some small power. But we're interested in large N. So, so provided that the genus remains small, uh, this formula can be used. I mean, we haven't thought about the case where the genus itself is proportional to n. I mean, that would be very odd for n being large. So on a fixed surface, g is fixed, and then it makes no difference what g is. Uh, right, now we work out some statistical mechanics using standard formulae. You work out the free energy, that's minus the temperature times the log of z, so you work out the log. And now for the first time, use the fact that n is large. This is Stirling's approximation to the n factorial. The log of n factorial is here. And here's the a minus four pi n, that is with a log and the temperature is out here. Now I could work out the entropy from this. I think we've never did that. It would be easy to do it, some derivative with respect to temperature. Entropy tends to be a bit messy formula. The pressure is easier. So from this free energy, you work out the pressure of the vortex gas. I mean, we're talking now about vortex gas. There are n vortices, they're on a big surface, and they're free to move around according to this purely kinetic energy on moduli space. And uh, the pressure is just minus the derivative of the free energy with respect to area. So all these terms drop out. You, you just have to differentiate this. 
And you get very simply this. So you get an equation of state. Uh, you know, pressure times this area minus four pi n is n times t. Now, in if for an ideal gas, ideal classical gas, where there are no interactions in two dimensions, you'd expect to get P times A is NT. So an ideal non-interacting gas is just P times A is NT. So there's a very, very important correction, this subtracting off the four pi N. And that's called the Clausius equation of state. Uh, I mean, it's more familiar in three dimensions, but this is the two dimensional analog where there's a correction to the area. And it's very remarkable, this is an exact result. So if you assume this modular space dynamics and we've worked out the partition function exactly and uh, got an interacting equation of state. This is very rare. Uh, usually it's done you know, with, with cluster expansions. So for example, you could study the statistical mechanics of hard disks moving around on the surface. And that's, that involves integrals, which you can't do explicitly. You can work out the first two or three. But um, this is an exactly solvable problem of statistical mechanics. I think it's rather rare. So I now move on to the quantization. So this is much more recent work. Um, so what, we need a Hamiltonian. So we, we canonically quantize motion on the moduli space. So we replace the classical momenta by the quantum momentum operators. Then you insert them into the Hamiltonian, which remember was quadratic in P and included the metric to determine the quantum Hamiltonian. Now there's always some operator ordering ambiguities when you quantize motion on a curved manifold. But I take the standard ansatz, which is to say the Hamiltonian is a half h bar squared. I mean, the h bar squared comes from p squared, that's here. And um, delta, where delta is minus the Laplace Beltrami operator. I mean, I think delta is called the Laplace Beltrami operator. So delta is positive definite, whereas um, Laplacian squared, Nabla squared is negative definite. So you put in the minus sign to get the quantum Hamiltonian as in ordinary quantum mechanics, and you get a positive Hamiltonian. Um, so the, the, um, the quantum states are half h bar squared times the eigenvalues of delta. Uh, so this is the assumption we make for the, quant for the quantization. Uh, it's not supersymmetric quantization, it's just uh, scalar quantization. Whoops, sorry. Um, so n and a are both large, and a is still greater than 4 pi n. And since m is compact without boundary, so I mean, sigma is compact, and so is the moduli space, uh, this uh, delta has a discrete spectrum of non-negative eigenvalues lambda. There is a zero eigenvalue, the ground state, uh, is a constant wave function with eigenvalue zero, and that's non-degenerate. But as the um, eigenvalue increases in the positive direction, um, you know you get degeneracies typically if there's any kind of symmetry around. And the quantum partition function is now again a standard formula. You, it's you know it's the Boltzmann sum, or you, it's the exponential of minus h bar squared over two. That's from here. Then you divide by then you multiply by the eigenvalue lambda coming from the delta and you divide by the temperature so that's that's there so it's our discrete sum over the spectra it's a spectral sum and there's a very standard thing and because this is a very standard construction in spectral geometry we can make use of standard results about the spectra of the laplacian on compact manifolds and in particular, there's nice, sim relatively simple results when T is large. And that is this partition function. So it's easier to find this partition function at large T. The first two terms of the large T expansion I've found in this classic book, Berger, Gaudichon, Mazet, called Spectral Geometry, I think, can't remember the title. Um, and uh, it, it's the following, you get some prefactor, and then comes the volume of the moduli space as the leading term at high temperature. And then there's a first correction 
which involves the curvature of M. That's, this is the integrated scalar curvature. So here's the formula for the curvature. You take the local scalar curvature. I think this is the Ricci scalar. There's, I got confused about a factor of two here. So there's some slight contradiction between my papers. I think I sorted it out in this talk, but it corrects a factor of two I got wrong earlier. And uh, so you, you have this integral, the scalar curvature, local scalar curvature of the moduli space integrated with respect to its volume form. And that's the total scalar curvature. And in the formula that appears with an h bar squared over t. And this 12, I think, is a correction to what I had earlier. It certainly is later, those factors of two. Now, uh, so we need the volume. So this, I've already shown you this. It's just repeating what the volume is. And again, I'm assuming the surface has genus zero, but not necessarily around two sphere, just any surface of genus zero. Uh, the volume is this formula, I've showed you that. But also fortunately, about 10 years ago, uh, Joao Baptista, who was also a former student of mine, worked in quite independently, worked out the to this total curvature. And he found that the total curvature is, can, is again given by a cohomological calculation. I think Marta Spate went through this as well. And you see, it's almost the same as this. You lose one factor of this a minus four pi n. You've now got n minus one here. But there is an additional factor compared with that, as you see, there's this, uh, the pi to the n is the same, but there's an additional factor for n squared. Um, and uh, yeah, that's sort of important change. Where are we? Um, yes. And so now substituting these two expressions into the partition function, uh, you know, I brought out this, this total factor and then it's one from the volume and this is the curvature correction, which is a quantum correction because it depends on h bar squared divided by the temperature. And now that I, I remind you of sort of my assumptions about the area and the number, um, I want basically the area to be a simple multiple of n. And then um, I get some sort of finite multiple, and then there's an additional n here. So um, it's, a bit it's a bit complicated here. Uh, yeah, this looks as though it's going to be large, but somehow it's got to be controlled by the temperature. The temperature has to be large as well, and h bar is small. So it's a bit confusing how big this is, but um, that is the leading quantum correction for large t. And then the free energy minus T log Z now has is the same as before, but with this extra term. So I, I take uh, I take the log of this and I'm assuming this is small relative to that. So the log of one plus this is this. That's sort of the leading and that's here. And the pressure of the vortex gas, you again differentiate with respect to A. So the pressure is minus uh, the derivative of the free energy with respect to A. And that's the term that I had before from here. And then th this correction gives, this gives a correction. And when I differentiate this with respect to A, I get A minus four pi n squared. And this makes actually more sense somehow. This free energy is always a bit odd how it scales, but this makes more sense now because you've got this N over A minus four pi n all squared. And so we can assume that that's small. Notice the temperature's disappeared in this term. The temperature's here, but it's disappeared here. Um, because I'll sort of take down a factor. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a cancellation because this T cancels that T in, the, in this term. Anyway, I can rearrange this into this form. So I, I, I've got an extra term in the pressure. I take it to the other side. Pressure plus this correction times a minus four pi n is nt. And now this is very similar to a van der Waals equation. The Clausius equation didn't have this correction to the pressure, but in the van der Waals equation, you, it's usually of the form p plus some number times n squared over a squared. Now this is almost like that, but we have this correction. It's not a, it's a minus four pi n squared. So it's, it's similar to the van der Waals equation, but not identical. 
Now, normally with Van der Waals, you look for phase um, transitions, but this is only this whole equation is only valid for large T. So there are no phase transitions in that uh, regime. But but there are these two corrections to the to the uh, naive free uh, ideal gas. Uh, there's this sort of correction to the pressure and this correction to the area. So, you, so this term arises because the vortices themselves take up area. Each vortex has an area for pi, basically. I mean, that's why this term is here. And this pressure correction is because of quantum effects. Now you can see what's going on at low density. That's, the, that's what happens when you expand in N over A. And the leading term is now the standards of ideal gas, but one plus some correction, depending on density. And this coefficient is called the viri second virial coefficient. This is a standard expansion of an equation of state. And this is the second virial expansion. It depends just on T, not on the N or A. And so the second virial coefficient is, is, is that. And um, the interpretation is that because this is positive with the four pi term, it means the vortex gas is repulsive at high temperature. That's even that's the classical contribution. Uh, it's because the vortices take up area. Each vortex excludes some area from the others. Uh, but this term is negative, which means as temperature decreases from infinity, uh, this contributes negatively. So the second virial coefficient decreases as the temperature decreases from infinity. And there's a softening of the repulsion. Uh, but I was hoping, and when I first wrote this up, that you could extrapolate this result down to this place where this was four pi. But it turns out that it's not valid to extrapolate this result to T of order h bar squared. That's, that's too low for this to be valid. But to, so this value for T much bigger than h bar squared. I haven't told you what h bar is, but it's a, it's a numeric, I mean, in my units, it's just a number, not in, its, not in its physical units. And we can assume h bar is small, we don't have to. Right, so that was the first quantum correction to the, vortex gas statistical mechanics at high temperature. But I was always keen to try and work out the statistical mechanics at lower temperature. But for that, we have to make a further assumption to simplify the problem. So this is about the statistical mechanics of dissolving vortices. And it's work I did very recently. We've got a preprint on this on the archive, but it's not yet published. And it's with a summer project student who started this in last summer, and we only completed the paper in December. So it's by Shi Wang, who has this sort of English first name, Franklin. And he's a student in Cambridge. Um, and uh, we work together on the summer project. So um, the quantum mechanical spectrum on the N vortex modular space, which means the spectrum of the Laplacian, is not known in general, but it simplifies near the Bradlow limit. The, the Bradlow limit is where is the dissolving limit. It's it's the limit where the vortices dissolve. And um, so I'm talking about the region where a over n just slightly exceeds four pi. So when a over n equals four pi, the vortices dissolve. And I'm talking about the regime where a over n slightly exceeds four pi by some number that exceeds one by a small amount. And that small amount is not independent. So it's, it, it, it's, it's you know, like 0.1, but not one over N, because then you get, that's a different behavior and also physically silly. Um, and then the vortices are called dissolving in this regime as the scalar field phi is close to zero everywhere and the magnetic field is nearly uniform. And in fact, the Bogomolny equations linearize in this dissolving regime, and you can do things much more explicitly. Now, again, I'm going to focus on the case where the genus is equal to zero. It's rather interesting to study this dissolving case when the genus is not zero. I think you've heard about that in many, in many of the other talks. 
you get these, the, the mod gas phase reduces to a torus if the genus is positive. But if the genus is zero, there's no torus. And the modular space is just CPN. Uh, this is the symmetrized nth power of CP1. Uh, so you know, the two sphere is CP1, and, and the nth power of that symmetrized is CPN. So that's the modular space for n forces on the surface of genus zero, not necessarily around uh, two sphere. In fact, that was the contribution of Martin Spade. I originally assumed in a calculation that the sphere was round and got this CPN behave, um, the, you know, study the modular space for the round two sphere. But Martin has shown that you get exactly the same result, whatever the shape of the genus zero surface. So for dissolving vortices, the metric on the CPN becomes the standard Fubini Studi metric. And Martin has shown that that's true for no matter what the initial shape. Uh, you somehow lose the metric information of the underlying surface. Um, but it's not standard for being fully metric with unit scale. You've got to scale it by a minus four pi. So it has the right volume. And as a approaches, oh, it probably should be four pi n. Yeah, it must be four, a minus four pi n. And, um, you know, as A approaches 4 pi n, this Fubini Studi metric collapses to, to a point. And the, I must have forgotten the end here as well. What's going on? Sorry. I must have forgotten the end several times. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so the quantum Hamiltonian is, is this, where this is now the Fubini Studi uh, Laplacian. And, and this is the, the standard Fubini Studi, but this is a scale factor, it should be A minus four pi n. And um, the eigenvalues and degeneracies are known. So this has got very large symmetry, particularly if n is large. And so a lot of degeneracy. The eigenvalues, are labeled by an integer k starting with zero and then positive integers. Uh, it's k into n plus k times four. And the degeneracy is given by this combinatorial factor. I mean, this is the standard combinatorial factor you subtract off this one. One could expand this out in terms of factorials, and we did that in our papers, but it's not very elegant, so I've left it like this. And then the quantum partition function is just the standard sum, this exponential Boltzmann sum, exponential of this, that should be another n, I'm sure. And then I've, I've put in the energies explicitly. Here are the eigenvalues, here they are. Uh, but I didn't put in this, here, this is the degeneracy, I left this outside. And now we've, we're assuming n is very large. So k runs from zero up to infinity. And one can see that, um, this exponential factor is basically going down as k goes up, but g increases very rapidly as k goes up. And the dominant part of this sum is when k is very large of order n. I'm assuming n is very large. So for all except very low temperatures, this sum is dominated by a range of k of order n. I mean, the, the, the range, is sort of, of some number times n plus or minus the square root of n, I think. That's the dominant region of integration, region of the sum. And so we can replace the sum by an integral. So we introduce this scaled version of k. So x is k over n. And so x is effectively a continuous variable because n is very large. And the scaled reciprocal temperature as an overall factor in the integral. Um, which is basically the inverse temperature, but has this sort of density factor as well. And um, so, so remember this little z, it's basically the, we call it the reciprocal temperature, but it's just density dependent as well. Uh, then this partition function turns into a, an integral and there's some overall factors of n, one outside and one in the integrand, in the exponent. And uh, this G function now simplifies, you know, because of this change of variable. 
And from the degeneracy, one gets these contributions, these first two contributions. And from the eigenvalues, you get this contribution, which has the explicit T, T in it, hidden in it, this temperature parameter. So we've now got this kind of integral. And notice this is extremely strongly peaked where G has its maximum. It turns out that G has a single maximum for some X. And you know, because of this exponential N times that, uh, you know, it's very strongly peaked integral. So we can sort of again do a Gaussian integration. So as N is large, we approximate the integrand by Gaussian around the maximum of G. And we've got to find where that is. That's the key sort of mathematical calculation. You've got to differentiate this and set it equal to zero to find the maximum. And of course, that gives some transcendental equation connecting x with z. And that the, we, we've got to solve that to find where the maximum is. So uh, we tried to solve this in terms of known functions, but that didn't work. And uh, instead, we, we did two things. First of all, you can solve this numerically and get x naught, that's the solution, as a function of z. And that wasn't difficult, really. And we also found asymptotic formulae for this solution for small z, which corresponds to high temperature, and large z, corresponding to low temperature, but not too low, because if you're too low, this Gaussian approximation fails. And then if we find this x naught, we substitute back into g. So we have to work out g at x naught and do a Gaussian integral. And there's some various factors to keep track of. And it turns out that the free energy, which is minus t log z, is a simply minus nt times the g function evaluated at the right place. And then the pressure is the derivative of the free energy with respect to area. And the, this doesn't appear to depend on area, but it does implicitly because z itself has an area dependence. Remember, z was this. So you, you differentiate this with respect to z, but that's a derivative with respect to a. And here's some, some numerical results. So we, we have these two asymptotic formulae. There's for small z. Oh, here's the, the scaled free energy. It's convenient to work with f divided by, by minus nt, because you see uh, f was minus nt times this g function. So, so by plotting f over minus nt, I'm plotting the g function. Uh, so here it is. Uh, and that's the small z version, high temperature. And this is this intermediate temperature, asymptotics. Uh, and we have formulae for this, but I'm not going to show you that. Uh, they're in our paper. Uh, as I say, z must be too big. And it turns out the criterion for not being too big is z should be less, much less than twice log n. Now, n could be very large, like 10 to the 20 or something. And then z, this means z is much less than about 50. This, this is the natural logarithm, of course, of n. So I, I, we plotted z up to 10, and that's well below 2 log n if n is really large. Uh, now, um, the numerical result fits this extremely well. So the numerical result, you can hardly see. That's in blue. But it, it joins up these two asymptotic formulae extremely well. So in the middle, you can see how the orange and the green are a bit different. And that's where the blue is right. And it smoothly joins up these two asymptotics. We have you know, very good asymptotic formulae. They, they all cover the whole range pretty well. Now, I have given the formula for the pressure. So these, this is the asymptotics. I didn't write down the free energy formulae. But from those, we just differentiate with respect to A, which is algebraically simple, to get the pressure. And for small z, we get this expansion in z. And for large z, we get this one. And here the pressure is much smaller because this involves z is large and we have an exponentially small terms here. And this quant in front is the Clausius equation of state. So these are all corrections to the Clausius equation of state. And the interpretation here is that small z corresponds to large temperature. So this formula should agree with my first quantum correction. This should be the classical result, and that should be the first quantum correction. 
And indeed, they agree. The first two terms for small z reproduce the classical pressure and the first quantum correction. And this calculation, we've been able to do work out the next term or even the one after that. Uh, but remember, this is special. This is not, this is in this dissolving limit. Uh, this, is, this is not true when um, you're well away from the dissolving limit and the vortices are well separated. This is where the vortices dissolve. They are all very close together and the scalar field is very small. Then we can do this calculation and find this correction. And also these terms, which is for large T, which means small temperature. Now I've already pointed out that, or mentioned that replacing the sum by Gaussian integral fails if Z is too big. So this is very low temperature. So if Z is bigger than twice log N, it's very low temperature, you can't, you must do the sum properly and not replace it by an integral. But it turns out here there's also simplification very nicely. The sum simplifies to, a to the series for a modified Bessel function. I mean, you can keep lots of terms, but they agree with the series for the modified Bessel function. And, and the one I'm talking about is this I naught Bessel function. And the argument of the Bessel function is 2n e to the minus half z. So this is for very low t, which means that z is large, and this is a small quantity. Uh, at least if z is much bigger than 2 log, much bigger than log n, I think. Uh, or is it 2 log n? 2 log n. So uh, we can also make a further approximation and just keep the first two terms in the Bessel function. Uh, that's also quite a good approximation unless Z is very close to this boundary. So we've got a very simple partition function, now very low temperature, but say only for these dissolving vortices. Uh, so the free energy is very simple, it's just the log of that, which is this. And now something weird happens. At this very low temperature, you expect the free energy is still to be extensive. That means it should be proportional to N, but it's not, it's proportional to N squared. That's really odd. F is not extensive. In other words, it's not proportional to N. Um, and when you work out the pressure from this, it's also proportional to N, which is again a surprise because normally the pressure of a gas depends on its density, but it doesn't depend explicitly on the number of particles. And that's weird. I mean, it's very small, this pressure, because this is exponentially small, but, um, but it's a bit odd and we don't really understand it. That's a bit of a mystery. Why is the free energy not extensive at very low temperature? There are probably some other physically known gases that at very low temperature don't behave extensively, but I can't pin down what that is. Anyway, so now we try and interpret these results. So these results collectively, not just this one, but so what I showed earlier, suggest that quantum mechanical vortices behave like bosons. Uh, now I know uh, Nuno was telling you that his quantized vortices behave like fermions, but it is a different quantization. He does geometric quantization of the first order vortex dynamics, and it's physically quite different. Uh, and his argument for fermionic behavior was based on the degeneracy of the ground state. And it was a fine calculation, but it's sort of completely different from what's going on here. So it's not a contradiction. And why do we be believe they behave like bosons? So the first bit of evidence was that the leading correction at high temperature, which I showed you, I won't tell you again, it reduced the classical pressure. And that's typical of boson behavior. Bosons sort of, in some sense, naively attract. I mean, they don't really, but um, they behave quantum mechanically as if they are attracting each other. And that tends to lower the pressure. And the other thing that suggests these are bosons is because the pressure is very small at very low temperature. You know, this, this is a very small uh, F and, and the pressure is also very small, exponentially small. And whereas fermions don't behave like this at all, when you've got a gas of fermions and you, go to very low temperature, you know, you fill up the Fermi C up to the Fermi level. And typically, if you reduce the area that's available, the Fermi energy goes up and the energy goes up and the pressure goes up. So you have a 
uh, you have a positive pressure at in the limit that t goes to zero temperature goes to zero but in this this gas the pressure is extremely small at low temperature and that to me suggests they're bosons this this is not strongly i haven't strongly understood this at all we, we've got a result but we don't have really an understanding of exactly what it means physically here's some graph of the result you see this shows the end dependence um this is the scale pressure of taking out some sort of Clausius factor against Z. And previously I showed you for Z up to about 10, but this is for much bigger Z, starting you know, 20 and going on upwards. And now what happens depends on N. So uh, you, you have this behavior from the um, Gaussian, from doing the Gaussian integral, but then at some point that's not valid and you have to do this Bessel function. And then you get this kind of um, graph of pressure against Z, which is the inverse temperature. And notice this is logarithmic. The pressure drops extremely fast as Z increases. Z is proportional to the, to the inverse temperature. And the, the, this is not a sharp phase transition. This is what we call a crossover because it, there's a narrow range in which this smoothly, this slope smoothly goes over to that slope. And it depends on n. So we, if the number of particles is 10 to the 5, you get a transition here. If it's 10 to the 10, you get a transition here. And if it's 10 to the 15, which is sort of closer to a typical real system, the transition's here at this value, in quite large z, to a very low temperature. And here's in more ordinary units. So this is not scaled and it's not logarithmic. So this is pressure against temperature. And uh, you see an ideal gas you get a linear behavior through the origin. You get, you get a graph like this. But as you see, the pressure is actually reduced relative to that ideal gas. And that's characteristic of, of this bosonic behavior of the vortices. And then of course, it's got to go, it can't go negative, the pressure. So it in fact, flattens out and it's extremely small here. And there's this crossover occurs at T naught, which is, Corresponding to z equals five. This is the transition between high temperature and intermediate temperature. The, the very low temperature is down here somewhere. So uh, that doesn't show here. So this z equals five was um, the transition from the high T asymptotics to the intermediate to low T asymptotics, but the very low is down here. Uh, it's time to wrap up. Classical statistical mechanics of these forces is exactly solvable although there are vortex interactions and they scatter off each other. The classical equation of state has now been extended to include the first quantum correction at high temperature, and that's for some vortices on a general surface. And these calculations use the exact results for the volume and total scalar curvature of the end vortex moduli space. Uh, and then in this dissolving vortex limit, one can do a bit more the mo because the moduli space metric simplifies to Fubini Studi, and the exact quantum energy spectrum is known. So the partition function can be calculated for all temperature. And we found asymptotic formulae for the pressure at high, intermediate to low, and very low T. There's sort of three asymptotic regimes. Uh, okay, that's it. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nick. Let's thank him. Are there any questions? Hi, Nick. Um, Hello. So uh, during that, it's Martin. Um, Martin yeah. Spade. Yeah. Yeah. Um, during, during that presentation, you, you presented lots of approximations, and for almost all of them, you're very careful to say in what regime they were valid. Uh, but the one way you didn't discuss that was the, was the main underlying one, which is you, this is all uh, approximating vortex dynamics by geodesic motion, or classical yeah. geodesic motion or quantum yeah. geodesic motion. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Can you comment, in particular in the dissolving limit, it seems to me that's not a very good approximation because um, in the dissolving limit, your moduli space is, is collapsing to zero volume. So the spectrum yes. of Laplacian is, is blowing up. It blows up like one over uh, four, um, the area of the surface divided minus four pi n. Yes. Um, so then throwing away the normal modes, that they're actually much lower 
energy than the things that you're including, aren't they? Uh, could, so that, you, that could well be right, yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree that in the field theory, one would have to do sort of really careful work to understand, you know, what's the right approximation and how does it depend on temperature? So in particular, I mean, one, one mode I can think of immediately really should be included is uh, one to allow the scalar field to change in magnitude because that's a soft mode. So, you know, in, in, in the moduli space, the scalar field magnitude is controlled by, you know, the integral by this Bradlow integral formula, which relates the integral of the scalar field squared to the um, area minus four pi n. And one could easily relax that constraint. And then instead of having CPN, I think, you'd get as C, you know, C to the two N plus one, possibly quotiented by a circle. So you just include one extra real modulus and that I can see that is one soft mode, but it wouldn't be difficult to add one soft mode to these calculations. And, uh, but I agree it's important to consider other other possible degrees of freedom. I mean, possibly it what helps that N is, N is love. I'm sorry? What about the phonons? I mean, the, just the ordinary small amplitude waves. So they- Well, remember you know, I'm, on, on a compact, I'm on a compact surface. Yeah, but you're, you're taking the area off to infinity, so- Oh, the area's big, you're right. The area's big. Well, one should so, look at- So the, the, yeah. the spectral gap will only be one, right? It, so one would think that actually it's the it's the dynamics of the mesons or whatever you want to call them. Well, I think A or itself dynamics. is proportional to N. So, I mean, remember, I've got a magnetic field around. So, you know, the, these oscillations around a compact uh, and approximately constant magnetic field. Um, you, you see, I think what I'm, you see, in this dissolving limit, the vortex equations look a bit like lowest Landau level states. So possibly what I'm doing is restricting the in integration or the spectra to the lowest Landau level. And you're, you're wanting me to include higher Landau levels. Now, I'm not quite sure what, what, what the effect of those would be. But I mean, it, it's very interesting to look into that. Yeah, don't, don't forget the background magnetic field, which itself is, I mean, the total flux is large. Yeah, and it has mass one, right? It's a it's a unit mass. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yes. So you may be right that the phonons are, have a small gap, but uh, maybe not because it's these these Landau levels. Could I could I suggest a challenge to those of you in the audience? You see, as you saw, nothing I did was supersymmetric, and it seems to me that it could be sensible to talk about the statistical mechanics of supersymmetric vortices, uh, which would be an extension of this uh, field theory, uh, including fermions. And that actually might then involve, ca again, cancellation of the bosonic and fermionic modes, particularly the ones that Martin's worried about. So again, the, you, you might be able to reduce this moduli space, but more rigorously. Uh, I don't know if you can do statistical mechanics, in super, combined with supersymmetry, but maybe, I, I just don't know. But it's a challenge for those of you who are obviously very keen on these beautiful calculations that are possible in supersymmetric contexts. Um, and it may, may deal with some of the worries that Martin has, and I, I agree one should worry about, yeah. Are there any other questions, maybe via Zoom? Nuno has a question. Oops, hello. Uh, right, so um, last time we talked about this uh, work, you were, I think, more convinced about the, this bosonic character. Um, anyway, so today you presented two arguments. One of them is that the, the pressure is very small at very low temperature, right? Yes. On the other hand, you say that, um, uh, well, in this uh, lower possible temperature re regime, right, this phase, you have this um, enhancement of pressure, which is not even, uh, yeah, um, proportional to n, but proportional to n squared, right? 
So this doesn't, doesn't, doesn't sound like, um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, some kind I agree. of. Um, it's quite difficult to think about. Reduction of pressure. It actually, it suggests it's a, an, an increase of what you would expect. Yeah, that's right. Now it's not even extension, it's not even extensive, and, and n is a very big number in your approximation. Yeah, that's so right. So I'm, I'm a bit surprised when, when you use that particular argument to yeah. argue that the, you're dealing with, with bosons and not fermions. Well, this, this, you see, know. this, um, this special function has as, as its argument n squared e to the minus z. So uh, I was expanding that. So I was assuming that n squared e to the minus z is small. And that's what required z to be very large, to be logarithmically large. You see, that's why z has to be above some multiple of log n for that n squared behavior to be suppressed. I, I agree. Otherwise, if, n, if, there was, if you just look at the n squared, it looks as though the pressure is going up rapidly. But, um, but you see, z is very large as well. And in fact, it's not, when I say very large, it, it's only logarithmically large. You know, if n is 10 to the 15, which is very large, the log of that is, is only, you know, order 100 or less. And so it's not a ridiculously low temperature. You see, when, when, you, when you take log, log n to work out a temperature, um, you know, that, that temperature is low, but it's not absurdly low. It's not, it's not like 1 over n. It's like 1 over 100. And that's the kind of temperature that physically would be quite accessible. In fact, that's what low temperature physics is about. You know, it's about temperatures around about one Kelvin or less. And so I, uh, no, I agree, it's a good question. And exactly what the behavior is, depending on N and the area and the temperature is a bit confusing. But um, it'd be good to have some insight from uh, some other area of physics where there are lots of particles but at low temperature only a few of them are important uh, and uh, you know i'm not quite sure what's a good, what's a good example of that yeah. okay i think that we should call it there thank you so much let's thank nick one more time thank you